My name is Anthony Abood. I'm the Lead Portfolio Manager of the Share Plus Fund. I've been at Perpetual for nine years. My name is Sean Roger. I'm the Deputy Portfolio Manager of the Perpetual Share Plus Long Short Fund. I've been at Perpetual for eight years. The Share Plus Long Short Fund at its core is very similar to a lot of other perpetual funds in so far that it invests in ASX listed companies. It has two unique quirks though. One is it can invest up to 20% globally, which it has in the past and done very successfully. And the other quirk is that it has got an ability to short stocks. So bet that these companies can go down. So what we want to try and do with this is leverage our big analyst team, to not only make um, investments on the up, but to actually find companies where we think are overvalued or um, have structural issues facing it, and we can make money and generate alpha for our unit holders uh, on the down as well. Shorting's been pretty tough over the last few years, but we're starting to really see some really good opportunities of um, companies which, where the share prices are, are representing some speculative excesses, and we think there's some really good alpha to be generated on the, on, on the short. And for an active manager like us, we love volatility. Uh, it was tough at the time, you know, when uh, we, saw, we saw the market fall 36% in a couple of weeks. However, you've got to take advantage of these opportunities to find really good uh, investment ideas. And we did that. The whole team really focused on finding well, let's not worry about the short term, but let's look mid-cycle. Let's look at what's, what are the earnings going to look in three years' time. And then also, also focus on the forensic accounting to make sure that the balance sheets are fine, that the company does not need to raise equity uh, in a dilutive nature. And we found some really great ideas, um, whether it be companies like AP Eagers, um, Crown, the banks, uh, or um, even uh, Macmillan Shakespeare. These are companies we should halved, but we, we found great opportunity to buy them when everyone else was selling. There has been a lot of focus on the COVID winners or companies that have benefited from changes in consumer behaviour or the lockdowns associated with COVID. There's clearly been some an acceleration in some of the structural shifts um, during this period, whether that's the consumers purchasing from retail, shifting to online or, or people working from home. There's clearly has been an acceleration in, in some of those shifts. The market's taken quite a strong view on some of these and any of the companies that are exposed to to, to, to those trends, uh, being the COVID winners, they're bought at, at any price and they've wanted to get exposure to. We found a bit of opportunity there through really focusing our attention on trying to unpick whether these trends are, are, are in fact structural or whether they're just transitory um, movements. And where we've seen, I guess, a bit of a difference in our opinion versus the markets, we've put on some exposure there, especially on the short side. Some of these COVID winners have been high flyers. We viewed a, a lot of the, the benefits they had as being more one-off than, than permanent. So we've put a number of positions on the, uh, in the short book to reflect that view. It's a big debate today, the big inflation debate. You know, is it permanent, is it transitory? It's hard to know. I mean, we, we've got a bit of a unique aspect here because we, we as a group get to speak to hundreds of CEOs within Australia, so we're always asking them. Across the board, they are seeing uh, yeah, more than just pockets of inflationary pressures, whether it be scarcity uh, of assets or just outright inflation. What started as just being a couple of pockets, like in West Australian labour uh, or shipping rates, has really become a little bit more broad-based. We feel that potentially that it is a little bit more uh, longevity to this uh, to this inflationary scare, just from the fact that we are seeing this, the fiscal dominance of governments all around the world, or the Western world especially, are happy to, to, to build up fiscal deficits to stimulate the economy with virtually no, uh, um, no one really uh, pushing back against them. So we can see this sort of being a multi-year phenomenon. Now what's interesting here is we're really, it's only been one-way traffic for the last 40 years as far as, you know, it's been really a bond bull market. Um, and we've seen disinflation or deflation for that period of time. So you haven't really seen many fund managers run money during an inflationary or increasing interest rate environment. So it's gonna be very interesting. Can we make money from that? I think on the long side, absolutely. In, uh, um, from a reflationary perspective, uh, you know, commodities generally do very, very well. Cyclicals definitely in the early stage of a, of a reflationary cycle should do extremely well. And we feel that in the financial sector, we feel that there's some uh, you know, good, op good opportunities uh, as, they, as banks and insurance companies can invest there and generate a yield uh, in their asset side of their book. The other thing we're seeing good opportunity in is a recovery in some of these um, some of these sectors which were hit by COVID. 
whether it be event or Qantas, etc. They're, they're the sort of the opportunities that we see. On the other side of the coin, we feel that long duration assets, whether it be bonds or equities, suffer in, a, in an increasing interest rate environment. And so when I'm talking about long duration, I'm talking about companies which may not make any money today, but there's promise of money to be made in, in 10 or 15 years. In the zero interest rate world, they're worth a lot. But as interest rates start to increase, those companies come under a lot of pressure. And we do, typically don't own that, own those companies or are, are, or are short. There is a lot of leverage in speculation in, in markets today. You don't have to, to look further than the US where you've seen a $350 billion increase in the, the level of margin loans in the market, a doubling in the number of Robin Hood accounts. Uh, or a four-fold four, four increase in the number of uh, unprofitable tech companies that are listed. In that environment, we see a lot of opportunities to, to short companies where the market's more focused on a, on a narrative as opposed to long-term uh, fundamental drivers. One particular area where we see um, a lot of opportunity at the moment is in the e-commerce space. These group of companies were obviously very big beneficiaries during the COVID period. Sales were very elevated due to consumers shifting their purchasing patterns from, from retails to online, given they were, they were locked at home and not out to go outside. And they also saw big in increases in their, in their margins during this period. There was limited stock availability, so they didn't need to discount and they didn't need to cut, uh, cut prices at all because there was, the goods were just, just flying out the, the door. The share prices of these companies reacted very strongly uh, accordingly. They're up, some of them were up three to four times during this period, which suggested to us that the market viewed them as better businesses coming out the other side of, uh, of COVID. This may be the case, and there's arguments to, to suggest it will. You've had that acceleration in the shift from, from retail to online purchasing, and these businesses have had a massive increase in the number of customer accounts that they've got. So there's reasons to suggest they may be better, better businesses. We take a more cautious approach, and. Uh, we think that some of the benefits they had during 2020 will prove to be transitory, but we also see some risks on the horizon in terms of increased competition for them uh, online. You've had a lot of the traditional retail businesses be, be have their focus turned to the online space, and you've seen West Farmers, Woolworths, and even Amazon uh, really ramp up their investments in more recent times. We think this will negatively impact the e-commerce players in one key way, and that is the cost of their customer acquisition. We view that as the online rent, they're not paying rent for storefronts, but they do need to pay to acquire uh, new customers. And as competition increases, the price they've got to pay to Google and these companies, we think will also increase. So whilst we see they've clearly been beneficiaries in the short term, we see some risks rising that over the long term, they may in fact face more competition than what they had pre-COVID. Given the share prices are still elevated, we see some really good opportunity to make some money on the short side there, and we've got that exposure in the fund.